welcome to my guitar repair video channel at DougMcCormick.com. This is the very first of many more videos I'm recording for this channel. Today, I'd like to show you the repair and restoration of this poor old Gibson 330. It's had an unfortunate life. When the customer brought this to me, I was reluctant to take on the project because, to be honest, I really wasn't sure how I was going to do it, or even if I had the ability to do it at all. I knew it would take considerable amount of time, expense, and effort to pull it off, but after begging me a couple of times, I did eventually give in and agree to do it. So let's get started. First off, I'll need to remove the section of the cutaway that had been cut and modified and was folded inward to create the new body shape you see now. I used my trusty old Dremel tool with the Stumac fret slot cleaning bit to make the initial cuts. I decided I would recreate the section using similar methods used in the original construction of the guitar. After that, I used an X-Acto knife to finish the cut and remove that section from the body. Looks like a can of worms. That looks like that's what that looks like. I was rather amused after finding a whole bunch of cotton stuffed into the guitar. No doubt it was done in an attempt to reduce feedback at high volume levels. After cleaning up all the cotton, it was time to clean things up a bit and create some new clean surfaces to work with for the next phase of the operation. He was in earlier and then shacked like six times. I'm using a flat sided pencil to trace out the shape of the remaining horn since it's a mirror image of the opposite side. I'll use this tracing as a guide when I heat bend the new side section on my bending iron. At home, I selected a nice piece of flat sawn maple and planed it to the thickness of the original piece on my sanding planer. This is my homemade bending iron. I made it using parts from an old toaster oven. I used the heating elements as well as the heat and timing controls to control the heat and turn it on and off. I placed the elements into a heavy aluminum tube that I got from a scrapyard and mounted it to a heavy floor stand. It works very well. And while the bending iron works very well for most applications in this shop, the radius of the tube is just too large for the very tight curve on this cutaway. Also, as you can see, no matter how much I pre-soak this solid piece of wood, it's just too thick and the grain is starting to blow out and crack as I bend it. Back to the drawing board. I went back and made a much more accurate tracing of the cutaway. From this, I made a mold from old 2x4s, taking into account the thickness of the three pieces of veneer I'll be using. I went to Harbor Freight and picked up this nifty pneumatic sander. I love this thing. It saves so much time, it makes it so much easier to make my mold nice smooth and accurate. Okay, so this is attempt number two. 
I made a wood steaming tube from a heavy piece of PVC drain pipe. I'll use my old cappuccino machine that I used for steaming off next to fill the chamber with steam and soften the veneers before I put them into the mold. I quickly brushed on some tight bond carpenter's glue onto the veneers and placed them into the mold. It was important to do a few dry runs as a rehearsal before doing the actual glue up. Always do a dry run before gluing anything. The mold is lined with a waxy masking tape so that they don't stick to it. After a little extra persuasion, the piece came out of the mold no problem at all. Yeah, looks pretty good. Time to move on to the next step. Here, I measured the opposite sides, width and height and made a quick little jig to help me line up the new piece so it matches perfectly on both sides. Okay, so what you're seeing here is attempt number three. I'd forgotten to record the trash can footage for number two. Attempt number two was a step in the right direction, but I found that the laminates made a piece that was too thick, it copped, it warped, it didn't hold its shape very well. So the third time around, I used a slightly thinner veneer and an inner layer of carbon graphite fabric. I also decided to use marine epoxy as the glue. Third time's the charm. It came out perfectly without any of the other issues I had before. It's time to trim the new piece down to size. It's a good idea to leave just a little bit extra on either end. I'll carefully sand each end to their final dimensions by hand. I used double stick tape and a cam clamp to hold my guide jigs into place. Using a sanding block, I carefully removed the remaining excess wood from either end and created an angled bevel on the ends of the piece and matching bevels on the guitar so that it hooked into place. It's time to trim this piece into the proper width, which is the width you see in between the top and back binding. Here, I've glued additional veneer to the inside to help add structural integrity. It'll create a platform for the notched kerfing needed to glue the replacement top and back of the cutaway into place. Here's a nifty little jig I made to cut repetitive slots into my kerfing strip. It's simply an L-shaped platform that has a guide pin offset from the blade and a stop log clamped to the saw table to achieve the proper depth of cut and space in between cuts. It's a strangely satisfying process. The kerfing is glued into place overnight. I also added tabs to the inside to hold it into place when I glue it. Notice that the veneer I glued in earlier extends well beyond the center piece. That's the piece that the binding will be glued to. It created a ledge for the wide and narrow part of the binding that will be glued. The binding is what's going to tie everything together visually and structurally. 
More about that in a few minutes. Now it's time to work on the missing front and back pieces. For now, I'm just setting the new piece into place while I make a tracing. I will spray glue the tracing to the new top and back blanks. Then I'll cut them out on the bandsaw and shape them with a pneumatic sander. Once I was satisfied with the inner fit, I moved on to the binding wedge using a sanding stick. It's not glued into place quite yet. I'm happy with the results here. It's time to mark off how tall the binding will be now. I used a scrap from the original piece. Before gluing the top piece into place, I trimmed the thickness down closer to its final dimensions on the belt sander so I won't be sanding for days, and taking into account that they'll have a sculptured contour to them. Now that it's glued into place, I can begin the shaping. Believe it or not, I actually use balsa wood, which is much easier to shape than a solid piece of hardwood. When I do the final shaping and fairing, I'll saturate the wood with a special thin super glue like glue boost to harden the wood quite a bit. Here, I'm gluing the back piece on, repeating the same process I used for the front. Alright, it's time to replace the binding. An X-Acto knife is the perfect thing for the task. I do expect some small collateral damage. It's really par for the course. Rarely does it ever come off without at least a little bit of chipping, even if you score it along the line. That's okay though, we'll deal with that when it comes time to refinish it. A chisel and a heat gun are pretty helpful as well. I've cleaned off all the old glue from the binding wedge, and now I'm ready to start gluing the binding. I'm only replacing the binding on the afflicted side. It'll really be the icing on the cake. It'll tie everything together and result in a virtually invisible repair. It's very helpful to use a, a heat gun when uh, forming the binding to the, to the ledge there. There's a lot of tension there, so uh, you really want it to, uh, you know, you don't want it to fight you. Want it to be very natural and you know go around the bend, just take it slow, do a little section at a time. It'll get a nice tight fit, just like that. I like to warm it up and shape it around the, the body before I glue it. Best to have a real good fit. Before you, before you glue it. The binding's now glued into place, and you'll notice there's a little bit of overhang there. That's fine. We're going to uh, trim that off with a, a hand scraper. <laughs> and sometimes I'll use a single, single edge razor blade as well um, when I get down to the, the nitty gritty. Sanding, sanding, fairing, sanding, filling, sanding, sanding, sanding. A lot of sanding in this work. Okay, it's time to tape up the binding and we're going to uh, just give it a light coat of uh, black paint uh, in order to be able to see what's going on with the, uh, with the splice on the horn there. 
uh, it's really hard to see what's going on unless you have a consistent color. So we go into the booth and just give it a wash coat, just something to uh, help see what's going on with the contour there. I've taped up the binding beforehand. I'll probably have to retape it again um, uh, a couple of times. So it's a pain. It's a pain in the neck, but get to do it. You get to do. So here, just a mist coat here. It's not a, uh, a finished coat quite yet. It's just there. You can see where I've sanded. Just gives me a, an idea of where all the high and low spots are. Okay, well I didn't mention this before, but there's also a big hole in the back. Uh, apparently made someone could uh, clean or replace or work on the electronics. We're going to uh, we're going to plug that hole and make it disappear as well. First, I'm going to make a frame around the inside and glue that into place so I have a ledge in which to uh, place the uh, the new piece in. In this case, I'm going to use a piece of hard maple to fill that gap. There'll be some fairing and filling and bondo and and whatnot, we're going to paint the back. The back and sides will be black. Here's an old piece of scrap maple I've had hanging around. It's just the thing for the job. It was a piece of uh, mason I used as a as a control cover uh, previously. We'll fill those with dowels. Let's check that new piece for fit. I've thicknessed it by eye, by hand on the on the belt sander. I'm using micro bubbles with marine epoxy to fill the gaps. Any any little lines there and using that to ferret with. It's very stable. I expect that the lacquer will shrink with time uh, and that will keep that down to a minimum. Now we're taping up the binding once again. I'm happy with the contouring and I'm going to tape up the binding and we're going to spray some color on that finally. Okay, before we uh, can actually spray some color, we have to make sure we do some final fairing. This is a gray primer that will uh, fill in any gaps. We're going to paint the back and inside it's black, a nice gloss black. And in order to do that, you got to fill up all the little holes and, and, and imperfections and whatnot. It's not unusual to take several coats of primer there. As you see, I'm sanding that piece there. It'll tell you where the high spots are, and uh, it's not unusual to do multiple coats until you, you, you're happy with it and get it right. The foundation is the most important part of any guitar finish, um, and it's, it's the most work. The spring is easy. But uh, doing the prep work is uh, a necessary evil. Uh, once again, uh, I taped it up to prevent the uh, getting primer on the binding. Once I'm happy with the, the fairing and the prep work there, I tape it up again. Okay, we're in the spray booth. It's time to uh, spray some, some color coats on it. Everything's taped up. I'm going to put a base coat on. We're going to follow that up with some nitrocellulose clear on top, multiple coats. 
we'll probably I'll probably sand this once again to get the very you know, last of any little imperfections out of the finish there. It looks a little rough and dry. That's okay. We'll sand it and, and just give it one final color coat. Uh, probably spray it a little wetter. You know, it's starting to look like a guitar. And here's uh, the big reveal here after the color coat. You peel that tape off of the binding. We'll, we'll clear it after that, after we clean that up and any little uh, imperfections there, we touch them up beforehand. To get a nice consistent look, I'm going to wipe some, some vintage amber stain on both the front and the back and, and the other side as well so it ties everything together uh, visually and it, it looks consistent. Even though I couldn't really, because of the big hole in the back of the, the guitar, I couldn't really touch it up without painting it black. So we went black with the sides and with the back on the front, however, I think we'll be able to keep most of the original finish. Uh, I'm just going to go a little darker around the horns there for the with the black, and then and go to, like use a mission brown. I'm also using an orange as a transitional color, and just a little bit on the edge to to clean up. Yeah, you see, to clean up the edge there and uh, hide uh, all the, the primer and uh, filler and whatever. But I wanted to preserve the original finish as much as I could, and uh, I think we did a pretty good job. There she is with uh, some some more coats there. Ah, starting to look good. Now that uh, uh, the million coats of nitrocellulose I have sprayed on this thing uh, have cured for several weeks, it's time to wet sand. Sand, 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 sand. My job is about 2% woodworking and 98% sanding. All these little spots and stuff, drop filling, I, well, over time, little things will shrink and they'll show up that you didn't see before. You gotta fill them up. You gotta wet sand. I'm using, uh, I believe, 2,000, you know, I'll send, I'll start with 600 and go to 1,000, go to 1,500, uh, water dry and then 2000 and then I have a foam backed product that's I've never used before but uh, it's very good that you can wet sand with it goes to three and five thousand grit and that's going to make buffing a lot easier which I'm doing here Okay, so there are some other uh, things that needed attention with this particular instrument. The frets really were all pitted and worn and had green stuff uh, on them. Let's give it a nice fret level. I'm going to clean up that fingerboard and buff up those frets. Ooh, it's all right. Ooh. Yeah. Good shave in that. And look, ma, it's got a horn. You'd never know. Spread the neck as well and did some touch up there. Time to put the guts back in. I use surgical tubing uh, and other 
It's like building a ship in a bottle. Time to string her up. Okay, that concludes this episode. I do regret not uh, playing the guitar so you can hear what it sounds like, but it sounds like a guitar. As a matter of fact, it sounds very, like a very nice guitar. The customer was uh, ecstatic. As a matter of fact, he was actually almost in tears. And that sort of thing uh, brings me great joy. Uh, in the work I do and I'm sure if you're in this field you can relate to what I'm saying uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and it's my hope that uh, there'll be many more in the future thanks for watching God bless